Welcome to River Foursquare Church. We are a community of believers that meets in person in the Seattle area and online. Uh, we have four communities that currently are meeting in the Seattle area, one in Auburn, two in Federal Way, and one in Covington, Washington. And we are excited to remind you guys that August 21st is our next all-community gathering at 6 p.m. at Grace Church in Federal Way. That's where we all come together from all of our communities, and we worship, and we get to have communion, and we get to see what God God's doing in the lives of each community and catch up with one another as we're all a little bit separated right now. Uh, we also have our online group started right now at 10 a.m. If you're finding this on Facebook and it's Sunday morning and it's 10 a.m., our virtual community meets every Sunday uh, virtually anywhere from around the world. If you are Pacific time zone ready at 10 a.m., whatever time zone you are in, you can come on in and join us with that with either Pastor Andrew or myself. And we watch the message together and we discuss the questions. We pray together and build relationship, which is what God asked us to do. Uh, is to have community with one another. And finally, if you're a part of River and you call this your home, we thank you so much for continuing to support uh, the ministry that God is doing through River Foursquare uh, by continuing to give of your tithes and offerings. And if you need help figuring out how to do that, you can go to riverfoursquare.org and click on that Give tab, and it'll lay it all out for you. Or you can, the easiest way that we found to do it is just to text to 84321, and you can type in your amount, and it's all done super easy peasy. Easy? Easy peasy. Yes. Not easy. It is easy. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you that we're gathering. That wherever two or more are together, because of you, you are there. The Holy Spirit, be there. Holy Spirit, be the one who teaches us truth today. Show up in every single person's lives right now in the name of Jesus, Father. Use all our gifts and talents to illustrate what needs to be illustrated today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we talked about, you know, sometimes you get discouraged. Um, you get beaten up. You get downtrodden. You get whatever other analogy you want to use. But sometimes we all get discouraged. And when we get discouraged, we have to remember what God is doing. We have to go back to the basics. And the basics are simply this, is that knowing that God is with you. The basics are simply that, for those of you, remember, I just, I just, I just put a little caveat. For those of you who are being obedient to God and doing what He's asked you to do, there is protection and provision. For those of you who are who are uh, doing what He's told you to do, there is protection and provision in that. Now, in all these things, we always have to remember that God's plan is bigger. It's more than what we can see in our eyes, and the reason why we can't see it all at once because it is bigger than we think. We don't understand all the mechanisms and all the nuances thereof of it. And then lastly, we just keep going. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. We just have to keep going. The fight is the, is the decision to go. The fight is the decision to keep going. That's the fight. So we keep going. And it, through all these things, we, we make decisions based on faith, not fear, because we side with God and we believe God is doing something. And so we side with him. So all the decisions we make are always in faith, never fear. So here's a question. As we start today, what did you see God do last week? Did you perhaps make any decisions that you had to use faith for? Did you wrestle with those decisions in fear? Or maybe you just saw God do things. Let's talk about it.
So now this week, uh, Paul comes to Ephesus, and he finds some believers there who haven't yet gotten everything God told them they can get. And that's kind of the deal here. So the first part of this is Paul, basically Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla, they go to Ephesus. And then Paul's like, I got to go. I got to go do some stuff. So he takes off for a little bit, and he goes on some roundabout journeys. He's got a vow. He's got to go to Antioch, blah, blah, blah. And then he eventually comes back to Ephesus. And that's where we kind of pick up right before that is when Aquila and Priscilla are there in Ephesus, and they meet somebody. And let's pick up there. Uh, are you going to start in verse, verse 24? Are you going to start in verse 18 or 24? Well, let's start in verse 24. Okay. Uh, now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia... The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he great was greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing but the scriptures that Jesus Christ, that the Christ was Jesus. And it happened that while while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And there he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into then what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, and that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with them, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyran Tyrannus. And this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both the Jews and the Greeks. So, as I was saying before, Paul and Quill and Priscilla show up to Ephesus, and Paul takes off for a little bit. And while they're there, Aquila and Priscilla meet this guy named Apollos. This guy, Apollos, he was from Egypt, from Alexandria, and he was a powerful orator. He was a powerful speaker. The guy just made sense. And he was talking about that everyone should be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, as, and they call that John the Baptist. This is the same thing John the Baptist would speak of and do. And Aquila and Priscilla heard this guy. This guy's right on. But Apollos hadn't yet heard about Jesus, hadn't heard about his death or his resurrection, let alone the Holy Spirit. And so it said Aquila and Priscilla took Paul aside and they're like, let me tell you the rest of the story. And so they share with him the rest of the story. And Paul is all fired up. So Paul has all this. He goes, the Messiah has come now. And there is this Holy Spirit. And so he starts refuting the Jews in public. And he, he's very persuasive because he's such a good teacher. And so much so, they're like, you know what, Apollos, why don't you go to Corinth and strengthen the, the church that, was, that Paul had just spent, it was a year and a half, pastoring and taking care of? He goes, why don't you go there and teach them and help them? So Apollos goes there. And that's why if you're familiar with this name, it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says this when he writes the letter to the church in Corinth. He says, I planted, a.k.a. I started the church. Apollos watered, a.k.a. he came later and taught you things, but God gave the increase. This is the same Apollos who's Paul speaking of. So it's kind of interesting is, is when it says when Apollos was at Corinth, or, I'm sorry, when, yes, when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul shows up at Ephesus. We don't know if they even had met at this moment. We don't know if they ever really crossed paths. We just don't know other than Paul appreciated the work he did because he understood his gifting. Now, Paul, when Paul came back to Ephesus, he finds a group of believers there who hadn't yet heard about the Holy Spirit. And, and Paul goes, he goes, so you guys are baptized? You're like, yeah, and John's. He goes, wait, wait, wait. You haven't got the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet? And they're like, oh, what is this? What is this you speak of? We don't understand. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. And so Paul explains to them, lay hands on them, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, 
praying out in what the Bible calls tongues, which we'll go into more detail in a minute here, but prays out in this, in this, in this language and that they're all filled. And their world is literally turned upside down by this event, this 12 man, because basically they say they go on and, and proclaim boldly the word of God. The Holy Spirit is a game changer. It's a game changer. And I know maybe sports people don't understand that, that phraseology, but what it basically means is the game might have been going a certain direction and something happens in the course that changes the outcome. It's a game changer. The Holy Spirit is a game changer. Changer. John 14, 17, familiar passage of scripture. We talk a lot here, especially in the book of Acts. Jesus says this, he goes, Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. For you know him, for he will dwell with you and will be in you. Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't just with us, but the Holy Spirit is in us. And this changes everything. Now, for those who... who so who can receive the Holy Spirit? Who, who does that really talk about? Well, it's all those people who know God. What does that mean? People who know that Jesus is God. People who know that Jesus died and took the punishment for their sin and rebellion against God. And people who know that Jesus, even though he once was dead, is now risen from the dead, and that Jesus is returning again to judge both the living and the dead according to the decisions they made whether or not to get forgiveness for their sin and to receive it. That's the criteria we will be judged on. You know, we talked about the day of judgment. That's your criteria. What decisions did you make? Did you choose to get forgiveness from me while you were still breathing? Did you choose to acknowledge your rebellion? And receive forgiveness. That's 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 what, and then your verdict will be based on that, right? So, where was I? So these people who know these things, I just excuse me, I just listed off, is that these people can receive the Holy Spirit and have God dwell in them. That the Holy Spirit wouldn't just be with you, but the Holy Spirit would be in you. Those people can receive that, and that they would become, as Scripture describes in Corinthians, the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit has decided to dwell. And this changes everything. This changes everything. Question. So, share a story that how being a follower of Jesus changed your life. Share, illustrate a story that kind of illustrates the point that because I'm a follower of Jesus, everything is different. I react differently. I think differently. I go about life differently. I've kind of shaped that for you. So talk about that.
So what is the this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because that's, that's what we're talking about today. If you want to get, you know, title names, it's, it's God's presence in fire, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I once heard this said, and uh, uh, one of the uh, writer read this first because he, he said this. He said, the church adopted the cross as their symbol. And he goes, they got the wrong symbol. They shouldn't have adapted the cross as a symbol. They should have adapted fire. Because the presence of the Holy Spirit was a game changer. Because they should have adapted fire as their symbol, not the cross. Fun fact. So what I want to talk about, though, is I want to talk about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to use Christian words to do it. So I'm going to use some different terminology because we got to be, once again, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, got to be able to explain being a believer in ways people can understand. And when we use words that are like, what does that really mean? We need to expound upon this. I'm going to try to do it. So let's, let's, let's first look at this baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit. The word baptism is a Greek word. It means to immerse. It means to immerse, Right. Um, when we talk about people being baptized, and you're like, oh, have you been baptized yet? Basically, what we're saying is, have you been in the water? Right? That's what we're talking about. Have you been in the water? Right? And so we know that as, <laughs> as believers, that when a person is baptized, that's their public expression that they've chosen to believe in Jesus and all that he did and stands for. Right? So this <clears throat> baptism of the Holy Spirit is immersion, but it's, or it's, that's a big word. Let me break a little smaller word. This baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be immersed in and with the Holy Spirit, just like you would be immersed in water, as in just as in you would jump into a pool and you'd be all wet. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit means <laughs> the Holy Spirit jumps into you and now you're all wet, Okay. <laughs> That's, that's weird, but true in, in the same way, okay? It's the same deal. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John the Baptist says this. He goes, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. And the straps of sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John the Baptist is speaking of Jesus because Jesus is the one who baptizes us or immerses us in the Holy Spirit, which is one of the uh, four principles of a four-square church. One of those principles is that Jesus is the baptizer or the immerser of the Holy Spirit. So John proclaimed that we'd be immersed with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and with fire. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, that that little flames of fire, little, 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 little fire things sat on every single person's head. And I still think the coolest part of the story is, is that they couldn't see the fire rested on them. They had to see the fire rested on somebody else, everybody else. So basically they're saying, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. And I always think that conversation, they go, check me, check me. Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Yes, you have it. Like, oh. like, there had to be that, that moment, the, the aha moment. Right. Of, of what was actually happening. Now, when a person allows the Holy Spirit to reside and take up residence in them, okay, because it is a choice. When a, when a person, and I'm going to say a believer because you have to be a believer in Jesus of those things I just laid out earlier, and I'll say them about three times later. But when a believer allows the Holy Spirit to come up and take up residence in them, they speak out in a language. And the Bible refers to that as tongues and basically language, right? They speak out in a language unknown to the individual. Okay? Speak out in a language unknown to the language. Now, this language this believer would speak out isn't necessarily unknown language, as in it's not like, Oh, you spoke Spanish, okay? It's not necessarily that, okay? It's an unknown to that individual, and it's a language that God understands. And what it means is it's a private language between you and him, okay? It's, a, it's the red phone, right? right? It's, it's, it's the hotline, 
Wait, let me get on the phone. The bat phone. The bat phone. Let me pick this up. Commissioner Gordon. Okay. So it, it's that thing. It, it's that thing. It's only language that God understands. Now, when we pray, right? So here's a word. When we speak in that language, we're actually praying because remember what prayer is. Prayer is having a conversation with God. It's talking with God. It's, it's a shorter word to describe. I'm having a conversation with God. So when we have or when we use or speak in our special language, Bible calls it tongues, when we do that, we're having a conversation with God. So it is prayer. Now, this conversation, even though we may not know with our head, we'll talk more about that in a second, what we're saying, we're actually praying the exact thing that God wants to see happen. We call that God's will or God's intention. We're praying exactly what God wants to happen. Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 28. It says this. Likewise, when the Spirit helps in our weakness, ooh, sorry, I, that popped out there. I'm going to use that in a minute. For we do not know what to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he searches the hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. See, when we pray in this language, right, having this conversation with God in this language, we are praying God's will, even when we don't know what it is, as in God's will. We're praying his will. Now, the Holy Spirit does this, as it just described in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. That we, when we pray or have this conversation with God, the Holy Spirit makes intercession. Okay, big word. Let's talk about that. That word intercession means it means to intervene or on someone's behalf. So let me use those words. So when we pray in our, in our, our language that only God can understand, the Bible calls that tongues. The Holy Spirit intervenes on our behalf and helps us pray God's perfect will for whatever situation that needs to be prayed. That's how it works. Asking the Father on our behalf. That was thick. I feel like we should have a question, but we don't want to have one. That was thick. We got to let that breathe. Okay, gotta let that breathe. Now, I almost seem silly saying the next thing. He goes, so why is all that important? Well, duh, I've just kind of unpacked all that, didn't I? It's like, of course it's important. Why wouldn't it be important? But let's let's get a little more granular in this. Why is receiving the Holy Spirit and having this prayer language, why is it important? First thing would be this. It's a promise from God. It's a promise from God. Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus, right before he ascends to the Father, he gives everybody a promise. Not that this is the first time he's ever said this promise, but the last words, he's like, I got to, I want you to remind, he reminds them of a promise he's spoken for literally thousands of years. But Previously, just a couple of years, I promise he says this. He goes, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is the promise that God has been promising for literally thousands of years, from Old Testament, from the prophet, from the prophet Joel to the prophet Jeremiah to, to David. All these guys have been talking and proclaiming that God is going to give us his, his Holy Spirit. It's a gift. It's a promise from God. So why so why is it, why is praying in a prayer language important? Because it's a promise from God. And why wouldn't you want to have this promise or this gift from God? Why wouldn't you want to have it? Why would you not? Second thing. Why is it important? It gives us a way to talk to God when words won't do. It gives us a way to talk to God when words won't do. Remember how I read... Um, back in there in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it says, in our weakness. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. He just 
Maybe I stole his words. That's the exact thing. It's when words won't do. In our weakness, the Holy Spirit makes or intervenes for us by having us pray in our prayer language with groanings that can't be entered so that we could pray God's perfect will for the situation that is happening, whether that be known or unknown. So there's times and places in our lives when we don't have words to describe what is going on and what we're feeling. We just don't have words. Maybe it's there's a there's a we're we're kind of in a in a funk. We're kind of in a in a downer mode. We're just uh, there's another word I can't. It was on the tip of my mind. It just went. It just went out. But there's an, there's another. We're just in this this funk, if you will, or there is this uneasiness or this unsettledness we have. We're like something's off. Something's wrong. Something's not quite right. Or we sense that something needs to be done. And I don't know what it is. That something is off kilter. There's something off kilter in the areas of my life that pertain to God. There's something off. Sometimes we would call that what I just said is something's wrong in the spirit. Something's off kilter in the areas that pertain to God, which is everything, right? And in those moments when we're sensing something's off or something's going on, this is when we need God to intervene. And I think we would all agree with that. We're like, yeah, I need God to intervene. But we can't put our finger on it, so we don't know what to pray. Otherwise, we already would have prayed. But we can't put our finger on it. And when we can't put our finger on it, that's when we pray in the spirit or pray in tongues or pray in the language that God, only God and our spirit understands. That's when we pray in our prayer language and we pray in that language until we get direction. Or until at some point as we're praying in our prayer language, all of a sudden, we can pray with words now because we have a direction. And so we do. We start praying in our, for us English speakers, English, right? We're like, oh, I know I should be prayed now. Or we pray in this language, our prayer language or tongues, until resolve comes to our hearts. And that looks like there's a, there's a, if everything was uneasy before, everything's become settled. If everything was unknown and there was chaos and turmoil, everything becomes peaceful. If there was a lack of direction and a fear about circumstances, everything becomes full of faith and a confidence that God is doing something. That's what I mean to be settled. When we pray in the Spirit and we're praying God's will— of course things are going to be settled because we're praying his will. We're praying God's perfect plan. And sometimes we might even be speaking things over, over our future that we don't even know what they are yet, but that God does. So, that's why it says, and I'm going to use this verse in just a second again, but I'll say it now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, Paul's talking about praying in the Spirit, praying in this language, praying in tongues. <laughs> Excuse me. He says this, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. AKA, he goes, when I pray in my prayer, like, my spirit is alive. My spirit's doing all the work, but my mind doesn't have a clue with what's happening. Why? Because your head does not understand the things of the spirit. God talks about that. He goes, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So Paul points it out. And so when we pray in this language, we are praying what needs to be prayed, even though with our natural head, it may not understand. The third thing, third thing, when we pray in the spirit or when we pray in this prayer language, it just takes care of things. Things get accomplished and things get done. Because when we're praying in the spirit, when we're praying in our prayer language, our, our spirit prays the perfect will of God and it cuts 
through the things our mind don't doesn't understand. We kind of talked about that just literally seconds ago. Because our logical mind wants to compartmentalize, it wants to understand, it wants to uh, make everything a category and a component. The mind is good at that. But the mind is not good understanding the things of the spirit, right? You want your mind to organize your shoes. You want your mind to organize your socks and where your silverware goes. Mind, that's it. The, that's his, that's his wheelhouse, right? All-star. But the mind is not an all-star when it thinks to coming to understand the things of the spirit because the mind and the spirit are at enmity with each other because they don't, the mind does not understand the things of the spirit. So, because our logical mind wants to do all that, it wants to categorize things in life, there are things in life that cannot be categorized. There are things that are in life that cannot be compartmentalized. There are things that can't be put into neat little filing cabinets. It doesn't work like that. There are things like that. Now, some of those things that are like that are anything that's of the Spirit or anything relating to the things of God. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. So our logical mind cannot put things in the bubble, which God says, those aren't my thoughts. So we need the spirit to handle that. And there are other things that aren't even tangible, such as uh, emotions and feelings. The logical mind has a hard time with this stuff. really does. We have to train it to be able to deal with things. And that's why we need to pray in the spirit so things can be dealt with that our mind can't grasp and categorize and put into its boxes. It loves so well compartments. We need to pray about those because the mind can't handle those. And that's why we have to pray in the Spirit. Now, once again, what are those things? Those things are dealing with the Spirit or the things of God. And also some intangibles such as fear. The mind cannot, the fear, the mind does not do well with fear. Right? So we need to pray in our, in our prayer language to help process and to deal with that fear, to get God's perfect will and to know what God's intention is and so we can believe for that and not believe for the bad outcomes, which is what fear tries to get us to do. See, breakthrough happens when we pray God's will. One more time. Breakthrough happens when we pray God's will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Look at this. And this is the confidence we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When we pray in the Spirit, we are praying God's will. If we're praying God's will, then it's going to be done. What if I don't know what God's will is? Pray in the Spirit. Well, I don't understand what I'm saying. I'll tell you what you're saying. You're praying God's will. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. All that to say this. Here's a question. Here's a question. If you have received your prayer language, share a time when you used it and saw God show up with direction or peace. So those of you pray out in the spirit with, with your prayer language, that's a better word. Share a time when you, when you actually did this and saw God show up, whether it be peace, whether it be answers, whether it be resolved situation. Let's talk about that.
So how do we receive it? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? How do we do all this? Well, first of all, it's a gift given to all believers, period. It can be done right here. It's a gift given to all believers, not Mary and, and Joe, but not Bob. No, Mary, Joe, and Bob all can receive the Holy Spirit if they are believers. And there's no age limit on that. And either. there's no age limit. You could be a baby Joe and a baby Mary and a well, baby as long Bob. As you, be, if you understand that Jesus is God and if you're God a believer. raised from the dead and you're a believer. And you're you a believer, that's it. it. That's the you're criteria. 89, 102, or 7. You have to be a believer, which we'll get into that in a second here. Acts chapter 2, verse 3 or three through 4. Um, this is the moment the Holy Spirit fell. And divided tongues of fire, or divided tongues as of fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all, look at the word, all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Right after this event, Peter goes out and starts talking to the crowd. And because they they hear this commotion going on in this room, the 70 of them, by the way, it wasn't just the 12, it was 70 of them there, goes out and they hear this commotion and they're like, oh my goodness, Jesus is Lord. And they're having this revelation. And, and Peter goes on to tell them, you know, you too can have the Holy Spirit. And that's where we pick up in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and all those who are far off and everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. So you look at this differentiation he makes here. It's, not, it's for you and for your children and for those who are far, far off. Is he talking about those who are in China and those are those who might be uh, in Alaska? Generationally. He's talking about generationally. He goes, those who are far off. Basically, he was saying, because I don't want to say your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I don't want to do all that. For all those who are far off. And he, and he says, he goes, you can have the promise of the Holy Spirit given to you. So, how to you, how is this gift, <coughs> who's this gift for? It's for believers. So, what makes you a believer? We know over this a second, we'll do it one more time. It's for those of us who have asked forgiveness for the rebellion we committed against God. And the Bible calls that rebellion sin. But it's rebellion. When we do willfully do, right, because Let's face it, when we, we sin, as the Bible cries, it's willfully, you don't accidentally sin, right? You don't accidentally rebel. It's an act of your will. When we ask forgiveness for these acts, that makes us a believer. When we know, not only do we ask for forgiveness, but when we know that, that there's a penalty for that rebellion and that Jesus took it by his death, he took it. And that not only did Jesus took our punishment or the consequence for our sin, but that he rose again from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He came back. And, that, and part of that is we've placed Jesus in charge of our life. He's in charge. Meaning he gets, he gets the say-so. He gets the say-so. He's in charge now. We are not. We gave up that right. And that this indwelling of the Holy Spirit can happen for those believers, as they just described, when we let the Holy Spirit move, right? When we let the Holy Spirit really move in is what we're saying. Because when we invite the Holy Spirit into our life, we're saying, Holy Spirit, move in. And here's the thing is, we're not letting the Holy Spirit be a roommate. Basically, what we're doing is we're signing over the title deed to our lives. And we're saying, Holy Spirit, not only are you a roommate, but you're the owner. Here you go. That's literally what we are doing. He's not, just a, he's not just a housemate. He's the owner of the house. He gets to decide what remodel projects get done and where you He gets to decide the chore list. Chore list, exactly. The whole thing. Now. So we've entered in this as a relationship with Jesus. He's our Lord and the one who forgives our sin, or Lord by Lord is. He's the one who's now in control. We've given him authorization to be the, in charge of our lives. This is what Jesus describes the Holy Spirit, or how he describes this in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9 through 13. <clears throat> it says this. 
I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who looks, finds. And the one who, who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if he asks a son for a fish, instead of a fish, would give him a snake? Like Izzy's. Who would do that? Joshua. And or, or if he asks for an egg, would he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good, good gifts to your kids, look what Jesus says here. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This whole passage, we use it all the time. We're like, you just have to pray and God, God will give you what you need. All right? That is true. But this passage is talking about, if we look at it in context, it's talking about one thing, the Holy Spirit. He's talking specifically about the Holy Spirit. He goes, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, you will receive the Holy Spirit. If you look for the Holy Spirit, you will find the Holy Spirit, right? If anyone who asks receives and those who seeks finds, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is ask for the Holy Spirit to come because God wants to give the Holy Spirit. That's his promise, right? You don't make promises you don't want to fulfill. This is his promise. So what does it look like? What does it look like to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, it looks like this. Maybe you're by yourself or maybe you're in a group of believers right now in your community. But this process is going to look like is you're going to say out loud that Jesus is the one who's in charge of your life. The Bible calls that being your Lord and Savior. And in that process, the Bible also describes that as being born again or born once more a second time. Now, you're going to make that proclamation out loud with your words because if you want to receive the Holy Spirit with words, you've got to speak things out in words, right? So you confess Jesus is, is, is the one who's in charge. And if you haven't done that before, well, great. You can do it right now for the very first time and still receive the Holy Spirit, right? Instantly. You can, you can get it right now. Same thing. So it's that. Now, if you're with people who are believers— they might, they might put their hand on your shoulder. And obviously, we're in a word COVID time, so, but they might put your, their hand on, on your shoulder because that's what Paul did in Acts chapter 19, 6, which is what he just said, which we just read. It says, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speaking in tongues and prophesying. So they might put their hand on your shoulder. Now, when they do that, if you're the one who wants to receive this indwelling, this immersion with the Holy Spirit, is you ask him out of your own mouth with words to be filled. That's it. And it simply can look as simple as this. Holy Spirit, fill me. That's all that needs to be said. If you mean it, that's all that needs to be said. You don't have to give this long diatribe. It's like, no, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Holy Spirit, I want to be filled. And say it out loud, though. That's the most important part. Say it out loud with your words, right? Now, at this point, if you're, like I said, if you're with a group of believers, is they'll probably ask, they will ask in agreement, or the, let me rephrase, they'll, they'll also ask for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so as you said that, they'll say, you know, they'll pray for you and say, Holy Spirit, you've heard this person say this? Fill them with the Holy Spirit, right? That's what they're going to say. They're going to do the exact same thing you did because they're, they're going to do what, they, what the Bible describes as coming to agreement. And they're like, yeah, they want that. I want that for them too. Let's pray. Let's, God can, let's make this happen. And as Jesus just said, if you ask, you receive, you seek, you find the Holy Spirit. So then you're going to do that. Now at that point, the rest of the believers, they'll probably start praying out in their prayer language, in their uh, uh, language that God describes, right? They're going to start praying out in their prayer language. Now, and the Holy Spirit is polite, and he's never intrusive. He's not. Because to do so would be against his nature and character. That's not who he is. And he will never make you do anything you don't want to do, because that would be against his nature and character. And it would deny you your free will which is the greatest gift he ever gave us. Which, and we know this by proof just by the Garden of Eden, or Garden of Eden because he, gave, he put the tree in there and he goes, you guys decide what you want to do. You want to serve me or not? If you want to serve me, cool. If you don't want to serve me, eat the tree. 
So that's the, the, and the very, at our, at our moment of creation, there's this gift of free will. So the Holy Spirit's never going to make you do anything you don't want to do. You have to allow him. Now, as you're there and, and the people around you are using their prayer language, sounds and words and things are going to come to you. Here's what I mean. Is they're going to come to your head. They're going to swirl around inside. They're going to be woo thoughts. Like, what is that? Should I say that? And there's going to be this compulsion, right? And what I mean by compulsion, you're like, should I say that? Should I not say that? And you're going to have things like, is that what it is? Is that? These are, these are common things. These are, I'm demystifying this for you because we've made it too weird, way too weird. It's not that weird. Trust me. These things are going to swirl around there. Now, at that moment, when those things come, you're going to have to trust God. I can't do that for you. You're going to have to trust God. And in faith, or with an expectancy that it is God, you're going to have to speak those things out. You're going to have to speak those things out. Now, it may come slowly at first. It may be just a word. It may maybe sound like you're stuttering or you have a stammering problem or, or someone needs a hitch in the back of the head so it talks to the, you understand what I'm saying? And speak that out loud. That's your action of faith because you're trusting in Jesus because he's not going to take control of you. That's, it's, it's, he's never done that. We're not, we're not puppets. He he's ne he's never, he's never go, done that whoa, whoa, whoa. in the moments of history. He's never done that so he would never do that now not who he is. So we have to take that action of faith. So as these as the words and phrases come to us, we have to speak those out, trusting their God. Now, every single person pray who is prayed for receives the Holy Spirit. Fact. Why? Because Jesus said so. Done. Every single person prays for receives the Holy Spirit. Every person prays for receives a prayer language. But I didn't speak anything out. Whether or not you spoke anything out was whether or not you took a step of faith. Because I can't control that. And neither can the Holy Spirit. He goes, I'm here now. I'm cool. Right? But every single person prays for receives the Holy Spirit, and every single person prays for receives a prayer language. Is whether or not we spoke it out, is whether or not we trusted in Jesus. And I know that's hard for the heady intellectuals to grasp their mind over. You can handle it. Believe God. When these things start coming to you as you're being prayed for, speak those out. Remember, we pray in the Spirit, our spirit prays, but our mind is unfruitful. So the, even though these things swirling around our heads, like, should I speak that out? Your mind's going to go, uh, your mind's going to do the whole litany of tests on this. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust the Spirit of God in communication with your spirit, or are you going to trust your head? So we should pray in the Holy Spirit every day or with this prayer language every day. Why? Because it's God's will. Why wouldn't we want God's will to be in our lives every single day? Matter of fact, I could be dumb not to. Can we be real? If we're not praying in the Spirit every day, that's not smart. Because that means you're not praying God's perfect will. Now, mind you say, well, I know God's God's will, and I pray that in English. Well, you're cooler than I am, because I don't know every single thing that's God's will in my life. There's areas I don't know. I'm not quite sure what the plan is here. That's where we pray in the Spirit. It's a promise from God. Let's receive all that he has for us. It gives us a way to talk to him when words aren't enough, when words don't suffice, where there is a discrepancy in what we can say that we can understand. It takes care. When we pray in the Spirit, it takes care of things our head does not understand. And when we, and we pray in the Spirit, that there's, that's the other thing sometimes people will say is, well, how do you know when to stop praying in the Spirit? When you're done. That's, it's so simple and trite, but it's the only answer. Everybody who's been a believer for a while who's received the baptism, they all, whenever I say something like that, they all, they all shake their head. They're like, yep. Yeah. Because we all know it to be the fact. How do you know when you're done? When you're done. And so it looks a lot like there's a peace, like there's a sense that everything is okay. There's a sense that there's been a resolve and a resolution 
to the uneasiness you may have been feeling. Now, well, what if I don't feel uneasiness? Do I have to pray in the spirit? Well, do you want to pray God's perfect will? Well, yeah. Okay, then do that. You, you don't have to pray in this. You don't have to feel uneasy to pray in the spirit. It's not a criteria. It just helps that. It just helps that. So today, in, in your community groups, pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pray, and, and I know that as you guys pray today, those individuals who are being prayed for, you will be filled. You will be filled. Why? Because that's what Scripture says. As I said, everybody, person, every person who prays is filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single person who is prayed for receives their prayer language. Whether or not they speak it out is whether or not they've chosen to trust God and speak those things out. And if everybody in your community group already is filled with the Holy Spirit, then spend some time just praying in the Spirit together and asking God for wisdom and direction for your lives and for the lives of those there and see what he wants to say to each other. So let's pray. Father, um, you see these faces, you see all these people, Father. We pray for everyone right now who isn't filled and they want to be filled. Father, right now we say, be filled in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Fill every believer who does not know the reality of this, who hasn't experienced it, Father, right now, fill them. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for doing the work. We thank you, Father, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Father. Remind us to, to rely upon you more and to trust you in all these things, Father. We thank you that we have the ability, when words don't aren't enough, to communicate with you. And we can know and pray what exactly what you want to see happen, Father, which defeats the works of darkness and releases the power of your spirit in our lives. And that changes everything. In Jesus' name.